Good morning. We're going to continue our studies in Esther, in Esther chapter 7. But before we get to that, let me briefly recap the story so far. Haman, the king's first minister, was an evil man and he hated the Jews. And one Jew in particular, Mordecai. Now, Haman tricked King Xerxes into signing an act, which meant that all the Jews in the Persian Empire would be annihilated. He also planned a special fate for Mordecai. He had constructed a pole 75 foot high on which Mordecai was to be impaled. Haman was at the peak of his power, second only to the king. However, he did not know that the king's wife, Esther, was a Jew and she was secretly planning to destroy him and save her people. Now, as part of the plan, Esther invited Haman and the king to come for a meal where she intended to expose Haman. But Haman was such a conceited man that he thought he'd been invited along for this meal because the queen loved him and he was the king's favourite. Haman was at the peak of his power, exercising power, and he was used to being in control. But as we shall see in the following verses, this power was illusory and his position was insecure. Now I say this because Esther and Mordecai were not working alone. God was their protector and was working for them and in them. And in a matter of hours, God would transform this situation. In a matter of hours, Haman was transformed into the emp from the empire's tough man into a quivering mass of jelly, kneeling before Esther, bowing and begging for his life. Now, the situation was transformed in an unpredictable way. Years before, Mordecai had heard of a plot to annihilate and assassinate the king. He reported this plot to the king's officers who thwarted the plot. However, his deed was forgotten. It was recorded in the annals of the king and then filed away. Then with amazing timing, something miraculous happened. Five years later, the king had a sleepless night and he started to read some of these old documents. And whilst he was reading these documents, he came across an account of the events where Mordecai king saved the king's life. And he said, what has been done for this man? Now, the irony of this situation was that he orders Haman to publicly reward and acknowledge Mordecai. Haman had planned to kill Mordecai and his plan had been thwarted. Mordecai was safe. However, the rest of the Jews were still facing annihilation. Now chapter 6 and verse 4 ends with Haman being... Four, verse 14, sorry... It ends with Haman being hurried off to the banquet with King Xerxes and Queen Esther. And this word hurried off gives the impression of a man who had lost control of the situation. At the beginning of the day, he was the one in control. He was the powerful man. But now he was being hurried off to a meal which would result in his death. Let's continue to read the story of the saving of God's people in Esther chapter 7. And we'll begin at verse 1. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet, and they were drinking wine on the second day. The king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition that will be given you? What is your request, even up to half the kingdom, and it will be granted? Then Queen Esther answered, if I have found favour with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant my life. This is my petition and spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. 
King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Who is he, the man who has dared to do such a thing? Esther said, An adversary and an enemy, this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine and went out in the palace garden. But Haman, realising that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Queen, where the Queen Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbano, one of the king's eunuchs, attending the king, said, A pole reaching to a height of fifty cubits stands by Haman's house. He had it set up for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, Impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. Amen. This is the word of God. We tend to think of powerful men as being invincible. We tend to think of impossible situations as being unchangeable. We tend to think of powerful enemies as being immovable. However, what we see in these verses is that God can transform even the most impossible situation in a matter of hours. And this shows us that we should never lose faith in God's ability to transform impossible, impenetrable situations. Charles Swindle, someone who is blessed by God, and we have the privilege in Revelation television of seeing him minister each and every week. Charles Spindell once said this, Every problem we encounter is an opportunity to prove God's power. Every day we encounter countless opportunities, brilliantly disguised as insurmountable problems. Esther bravely went off to confront Haman, and there's a sense she felt that it was all up to her, and she had resigned herself to her fate, saying, look, if I perish, I perish. She went into the king, but she had no idea that Haman's confidence had been fatally undermined. He was off balance. He was no longer in control of the situation, and he was vulnerable. And this is how God works. Like Esther, we faithfully plan and fearfully step out in faith, thinking it all depends on us. We resign ourselves to giving ourselves to God's service with little hope of seeing any results for our efforts. We get into the habit of not expecting God to work so as not to be disappointed. But we forget, however, that God goes ahead of us and is working in our situations. Now, we're not alone. We're not carrying the burden alone. And the work of God will not collapse without us. The work of God is His work. The church of God is His church. The mission of God is His mission. And we sing and we talk of our belief in an almighty, powerful God, but our actions and our attitudes often suggest that we don't actually believe this and we feel that God is weak and lacking power to act in our situation. And often we work so hard because we feel that we have to save God from the embarrassment of failure. God has called us to the mission of reaching into our communities with the gospel of Christ. He needs us to be willing to go and to share this glorious gospel. He needs us to step out in faith and risk rejection. However, it is thrilling to know that it is not about us. God is at work right now in insurmountable, impossible situations all around us. I believe God is at work in this COVID-19 crisis. The devil wants to use this crisis to destroy his church, but I believe God will turn this situation round and that God will use this situation to bring his glorious gospel to people who have yet to hear of God's love and God's great saving power.
There are people right now within a mile or two where you're watching this program who at this very moment are being drawn to Christ. And God, through the Holy Spirit, will draw these people and a year from now they will be worshipping God in his church. Esther chapter 6 and chapter 7 shows us the power of God to transform impossible, impenetrable situations. In chapter 7, we see the beginning of the deliverance of the Jews and the end of Haman. The story reads so well that it almost seems superfluous to comment upon it. Even so, I'd like to spend just a few minutes concentrating on one particular verse, which to me sums up the transformation of Esther's character from someone who was self-indulgent to someone who became a servant of God. And that verse is in chapter 7 and verse 3, where Esther says to the king, If I have found favour with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant my life. This is my petition, and spare my people. This is my request. Esther had come a long way since she first went into the uh, palace. Her initial concern when she went into the palace was for her self-preservation. She hid her identity as a Jew from the king. In the palace, she was safe and protected from the threat which faced her people. But now she was totally identified with her people. She talked about my people and their fate, our fate. Now, this is the same Esther who sent clothes down to Mordecai because He was embarrassing her by wearing sackcloth and ashes. Esther had come a long way in a short space of time. And I'd like us to take this journey with her because all of us make the same spiritual journey. And there are three stages to this journey. The first stage is one of self-indulgence. When Esther first went into the palace, she was pampered and looked after. Every need was catered for. She didn't even have to worry about anything. In Esther chapter 2 we read that she spent 12 months being pampered and being given the best beauty treatments. She was indulged beyond our imagination and as a result she became completely absorbed in herself and her own self-importance. Therefore when Mordecai initially confronted her with the fate of her people and challenged her to do something, her initial reaction was, it's not my problem. Or I'm powerless to do anything. God had put her in the palace for such a time as this. But there she was enjoying being indulged. Now when we first come to Christ, we are totally absorbed in ourselves and our needs. Now there's nothing wrong with that. Indeed, it is understandable. After all, When we first become a Christian, we are called babes in Christ. And that word babe in Christ is important. It's an important concept to get hold of. Because when we become a Christian, we are born into Christ. We become his responsibility. 1 Peter 5 and verse 7 says, Cast all your anxieties, your cares upon him, for he cares for you. And the New English Bible translates this, He cares for you, for you are his charge. In short, when we come to Christ, we come to Christ, he cares for us. We belong to him. Now, the first few weeks of being a parent is a tense time. You look at this tiny child and you realize what an awesome responsibility it is. Within all of us as parents, there's a deep desire to protect and yes, to pamper our offspring. The instinct stays with us throughout our life, even though my children are grown up and I've got grandchildren now. I still want to help and to protect my children. Now, if we have this desire to pamper and to protect our children, is it not reasonable to assume that the Lord Jesus Christ wants to do the same? Christ does not expect babes in Christ to take up too much responsibility in the early years of their Christian life. Babes in Christ need time to absorb the wonder of the world that they they have been born into. Now, when my children were small, I did not expect them to share in the household chores. We pampered them. 
And one of the saddest sights we often see in the world is children in a two-thirds world who have to work for pennies and cents to support their families. This, there's a sadness and there's a burden in their eyes. And this is because they're being robbed of their innocence. They're being robbed of their childhood. Now, sadly, it's not uncommon to find this same burdened expression in the faces of people who come to Christ and then who are burdened down with responsibility. They're thrust into ministry and mission and they're never given time to absorb the wonder and the joy of being born into Christ. And that sullenness and the sense of burden goes on throughout the Christian life. They see the Christian life as a burden, not a joy. And so the first stage of Esther's journey was being at the centre of attention. In many ways, this was a time of preparation for what was to follow. For the next stage was a growing awareness of the world outside and the responsibility which comes from being in a privileged position. In chapter 4, we saw Mordecai challenged Esther to use her position and her influence to save her people. It was a very uncomfortable experience for her. The dilemma she faced was that she knew in her heart that God had placed her in this palace to save her people, but her instinct was not to get involved. Now, the process which Esther was going through was moving from a babe in Christ to being an adolescent believer. Adolescence is a time of tension. It's a time where we want to grow up, we want to be independent, but we don't really want to be burdened down with responsibility. It's a time of rapid change and uncertainty. When the certainty of life moves from the security of a home and our parents to the insecurity of the world outside. It's an uncomfortable time because one part of us wants to stay safe at home with mum and dad, whilst another part of us wants to go out into the future in the world because we know our future lies out there. Much of this tension is worked out in anger and frustration and sullenness and rebellion, as Mark Twain famously said. When I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant I could hardly stand to have the old man round. But when I got to 21, I was astonished how much he had learned in those seven years. Again, in our walk in Christ, we also go through a time of spiritual adolescence. And I'm not talking only about young people. There are many Christians in their 40s and 50s and 60s who behave like spiritual adolescents. They never get involved in church life but they know everything they need to know about running a church. Now, as we mature as Christians, there is a growing awareness that the purpose of God lies out there in his mission. However, there is a tension. Parts of us want to stay absorbed in adolescence, but another part wants us to move out into God's purpose and God's mission. Now, spiritual adolescence is the most important and critical part of our spiritual journey and our spiritual growth. If we are to mature as Christians, it's vital that we do not remain as babes in Christ and that we move through spiritual adolescence onto spiritual maturity. Now, if we do not make this transgression, we will never realize God's purpose for our lives. We will never discover the potential God has put in us and we will without realizing cause disruption and havoc to the work of the gospel. A church dominated by spiritual adolescence is characterized by a people who believe that they know it all. They insist on doing it their way. They are the focus of attention. They always look inwards, never outwards. A church full of spiritual adolescence, never fulfills its God-given potential. Now, when you go into such a church, you can cut the atmosphere with a knife. It's like going into the home of a where there's a disruptive teenager, where the parents are always on edge, 
waiting for the next spark to start the next confrontation. Now the question is, how do we move on from spiritual adolescence to spiritual adulthood? And this brings us to the third stage of Esther's spiritual maturity and development. And that is a total involvement and identification with the mission of God. Esther came to the point in her spiritual journey where the plight of her people was not out there and she allowed it to touch her heart and challenge the direction of her life. And as a consequence, she became totally identified with, with her people and their suffering and gave herself unreservedly to the task of their salvation. Now this journey to spiritual maturity for me is personified by her words in verse 3. If I have found favour with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant my life. This is my petition and spare my people. This is my request for I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed and annihilated. If we're merely sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. Do you see it now? Esther's totally identified and absorbed with her people's plight. And there was even a willingness to die with them. And what we see here is spiritual maturity is characterized by incarnational love and unconditional service. You see, spiritual maturity is not about how much we know. It's about how we act. Now, I've known Christians who have a lot of biblical and theological knowledge, but nevertheless act in an immature way. Now, when I was a young Christian, someone gave me a booklet by a man called Dawson Trotman, and it was a booklet that changed my life. And this booklet was called We Are Saved to Serve. And the theme of the booklet is that we have been saved to be part of the great mission of God. And we are literally saved to serve. However, many Christians see the purpose of Christianity differently. They feel that they are saved not to serve, but to be served. One of the great curses of the Christian faith in Britain today is what I would call duvet Christianity. And what I, meant, what I mean by duvet Christianity is that a duvet keeps you nice and warm and comfortable and you don't even have to make the effort to make the bed in the morning. And one of the reasons why the Church of Christ is moving forward in different parts of the world as people realize that they're not to saved to be served but are saved to serve. Now this biblical pattern of discipleship is expressed to us in 1 John 3 and verse 16 where John says this by this we know love that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren incarnational love is about committing ourselves to our brethren and committing ourselves to the great mission of God in short it's about getting involved it's about taking a risk it's about sharing the pain it's about suffering the loss now when I was learning to preach. Uh, we used to do preaching practice. In other words, we used to go out and we used to preach before all the other students and then they would critique your sermon. And it was very helpful. It sounds horrible, but it was very helpful. And after one sermon, which I preached, the uh, tutor said, Ian, you, that was a good sermon, but you would do better from changing the pronouns and I said what do you mean you talk about them you talk about you talk about you and I'd like you to change the pronouns and talk about we and talk about us in other words identify to the with the people you're preaching to now in George Eliot's Middlemarch the key character in the whole of the book was a woman called Dorothea and she was portrayed as someone who had a deep Christian faith, who cared about people, who cared about the world. And at the end of the novel, Dorothea's life is summed up in the following way. 
her full nature, spent itself in deeds which left no great name on earth. But the effect of her being on those around her was incalculable. For the goring good of the world is partly dependent upon unhistoric acts of all those Dorotheas who live faithfully their hidden lives and rest in unvisited graves. This for me sums up incarnational love. It's a willingness to be spent for others with no guarantee of recognition and fame. When Esther went into the king, she had no idea of the outcome. She was now totally identified with her people and was willing to surrender to their faith. Esther had journeyed to this point of surrender. She had moved from being totally absorbed and of little use to God through spiritual adolescence and now was behaving like a spiritual adult, willing to be part of God's mission. Now I can almost hear some of you thinking that I'm contradicting myself. At the beginning of this talk, I was saying that it all depends on God and that God could find someone else if Esther wasn't willing to do his bidding. Now I seem to be saying the opposite and that spiritual maturity is about giving ourselves to the service of Christ. And I have to admit there's a tension here and we need to resolve this tension John Wesley used to have a saying which for me sums up how we can begin to resolve this tension. How we can be totally dependent upon God and yet be committed to the service of Christ. He used to say this, that a disciple of Christ must work as though it all depended upon him. But he must also pray as though it all depended on God. Now in summary... I want to leave you with this question. Where are you on your spiritual journey? I'm not, saying how lo- I'm not asking how long have you been a Christian, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, but where are you on your spiritual journey? Are you a spiritual baby? Are you totally absorbed in yourself and your needs and you feel aggrieved when those needs are not being met? Are you a spiritual adolescent? Do you have a negative attitude towards God and his church? Are you critical about other people? Do you feel or act as though you are superior to everyone else and you know more than them? Or are you a spiritual adult? Are you willing to sacrifice your own ambitions for the sake of the gospel of Christ? Where exactly are you on your spiritual journey? May God bless you this morning and may you have a good day. May you have a day full of the presence of God and may you know his purpose for your life. Amen.